Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2017 installment of the INSAR Summer Institute. My name is Ashley Stevens, and I'm a member of the INSAR Student and Trainee Committee and a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Utah. I'd like to welcome you all to this week's session of the INSAR Summer Institute, featuring Dr. Roy Richard Grinker. This session is part of a six-week online series presented by the International Society for Autism Research. I'd like to thank the INSAR Board of Directors for their support in this event and the INSAR Student and Trainee Committee for their dedication to organizing this session. This is our third installment of the Summer Institute, and this year we have focused the topics on culture and diversity. This series was dedicated to this very important topic due in large part to feedback we receive from our participants. We appreciate any feedback on the Summer Institute, especially ideas for future series. There will be an opportunity to submit feedback following today's session, as well as at the end of the summer. The Summer Institute was designed to provide a forum for the presentation and discussion of autism-related research topics that is accessible for people new to the field. While the Summer Institute was originally motivated by and conceptualized for early career researchers, specifically for graduate students and postdocs, we're excited to invite anyone interested in autism research to listen and participate. We hope that the Summer Institute provides an opportunity for scientists and stakeholders with different backgrounds and from all around the globe to learn from each other and ultimately advance our understanding of autism. All Summer Institute sessions are free and accessible to attend live to anyone who has created a My NSAR account. Sessions will be recorded and available for replay following the conclusion of the entire series. This week, our session features a presentation from Dr. Roy Richard Grinker. He will be providing an anthropological view of autism research. Learning objectives for this session include looking at autism spectrum disorder and how it exists throughout the world, even in societies that have no name for it, how autism are products of the interplay between biological, psychological, and cultural phenomenon, understanding how autism varies internationally in terms of its clinical manifestation and the extent of a disability associated with the disorder, and then finally, local factors affecting prevalence estimates, including poverty, access to services, racial discrimination, stigma, cultural beliefs about what kinds of behavior are normal and abnormal, and a nation's public health infrastructure. Before we get started, please know that you can ask questions for Dr. Grinker at any time. We will leave plenty of time for discussion during the back half of the session. Ask a question at any time using the chat window on the left of your screen, and we'll get to as many of them as possible during the discussion period. At the very end of the session, we'll leave a few minutes to talk about career development. If you want to get some advice about career development topics from Dr. Grinker, please post your questions in the chat window, and we'll incorporate them in our discussion. Also know that there are background materials for today's talk. If you haven't already, you can download these now at autism-insar.org. These materials define some of the key terms and provide suggested reading in the literature. I'd, now, I'd also like to thank Akisha Sridhar and Abigail Piach for their help preparing and running today's session. I would now like to introduce Dr. Roy Richard Grinker. Dr. Grinker is a cultural anthropologist specializing in ethnicity, nationalism, and psychological anthropology with topical expertise in autism, Korea, and Sub-Saharan Africa. He is also the director of George Washington University's Institute for Ethnographic Research, director of the Institute for African Studies, and editor-in-chief of the Journal of Anthropological Quarterly. Dr. Research has conduct, or Dr. Grinker has conducted research on a variety of subjects, including ethnic relationships between farmers and foragers in the Ituri Forest, the Democratic Republic of Congo, 
North and South Korean relations with a special emphasis on North Korean defectors adaptation to South Korean life and the ed epidemiology of autism. In addition, he's written a biography of the anthropologist Colin N. Turnbull. After completing the first ever epidemiological study of autism in South Korea, Dr. Grinker is funded by the Autism Speaks Foundation to study the cultural influences on identification and treatment of ASD among Korean Americans. In addition, he's studying efforts at an early identification of autism among Mexican migrant farmers in Southwest Florida and among Zulu-speaking South Africans in KwaZulu Natal, South Africa. A second area of research is military psychiatry, about which he is writing a book. I will now turn it over to Dr. Grinker for his talk entitled Cross-Cultural Views of ASD, an Anthropological Perspective. Thank you for joining us and welcome Dr. Grinker. Hi, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, we'll now uh, begin uh, with this presentation. I really uh, am grateful that I have the opportunity to speak with um, all of you. The uh, photograph that you see on the first slide is a photograph of my daughter who uh, for most of her life uh, has not liked to be photographed, at least from the front. Uh, here she is at the Georgia Aquarium, one of her favorite places in the world. And like many people who have become involved in autism research, I got involved through personal reasons. I didn't know much about autism. I didn't know many people with autism. And my daughter, who was born in 1991, uh, began to show the signs of developmental delay at around um, 12 to 15 months. Uh, by the time she was two years old, uh, we knew something wasn't right with her. Uh, we brought her for evaluation, and uh, she was eventually diagnosed with autism. The time period that we're talking about is 1994, early 1994. And this is just around the time that we start to see autism becoming increasingly popular as a diagnosis, and when we start to see increasing concern in the media and among advocacy groups about the possibility that there was a true increase in incidence. In fact, the term epidemic began to be used. As an anthropologist and as a father, I was very interested in how it was that a certain diagnosis was now becoming more popular to try to figure out whether this notion of an increase in prevalence was in fact an increase in incidence or whether it had to do with changes in scientific practice, in classification within psychiatry. And I had had a lot of experience as a young child with psychiatry. I wasn't in treatment but my father, my grandfather, and my great-grandfather were all psychiatrists and all psychoanalysts. So I was kind of steeped in the tradition of looking at psychiatry not at the moment, but as having a particular history. And when we start to look at the history of psychiatry, we cannot escape the role of culture. And what we'll do later in this presentation is really talk about what that word means when we talk about uh, mental disorder, mental illness, a disability, and so on. Now, first, I do want to tell you where my funding comes from. Uh, my funding uh, comes uh, from the sort of typical funders of autism uh, research, uh, with the exception of the United States Institute of Peace, which is uh, a uh, funding arm of the U.S. Congress for issues on peace, and that was for my work uh, not on autism, but for uh, work on North Korean defectors' adaptations to South Korea. I want to now uh, point out that we have a tremendous amount of international awareness. Uh, I think that since I made this slide, there's probably been a few more autism societies that have uh, been founded throughout the world. What we're seeing is a tremendous increase both in the awareness of the concept of autism but also an awareness that the diagnosis can have meaning, that it can lead to different kinds of treatments, that it can lead to different kinds of interventions. And this is a very 
important development in the world because it challenges us then to view autism both as a category that appears to have universal validity, but also as a category that may be indigenized. It may take shape in different ways, in different societies, with different cultures, with different histories. Despite the fact that there is so much more international awareness about autism, we actually don't have that much information on autism from a scientific level, that is reliable information about its clinical manifestations, about its onset, the date of, uh, of the age of onset, the course of the disorder, the outcomes, and so on. Now here is a map that shows you in blue where all of these autism advocacy societies are, regional, national societies. But if we look at a slide of epidemiologic data, we find that we are very, have very few places uh, where we have reliable information. We have some anecdotes here or there, some anecdotal information in, in a range of countries that are not in blue. But for the most part, all we have is information from North America, Northern Europe, Australia, Japan, and South Korea, which should be colored here in blue, but I, I had an error in my slide. Uh, though it would only um, uh, constitute a tiny dot there to the west of Japan. But in other words, the notion that autism exists everywhere in the same way that we think it exists in the U.S. or in Europe, the same way that it appears in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, that is an assumption. That is an assumption. And until we do more international research, we are not going to uh, be able to answer um, the many questions about cultural variability. So I said as a child that I was steeped in the history of psychiatry. And I remember in 1972, my grandfather was the editor of the Archives of General Psychiatry. And he published an article by a man named R.E. Kendall. This is, again, 1972. And in 1972, Kendall did a study in which he showed videos of people who had been diagnosed in the United States with uh, either schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. And he showed the videos and then asked British psychiatrists and American psychiatrists to give a diagnosis based only on the video. The video was an interview with a clinician. And in the most um, drastic or severe extreme case, there was one video of a 30-year-old man described simply as a bachelor. And when asked to give the diagnosis, 69% of American psychiatrists said the man had schizophrenia. Only 2% of psychiatrists said that the man uh, from, from England said that the man had schizophrenia. Now, how could there be such a dramatic difference in societies that you would think would be culturally similar in how they viewed mental illness? And so I introduced this example in order to show you that there is variability even within societies that we would think of as very similar. Now imagine how differently a clinician from India and a clinician from Canada might see a particular patient. And you get a sense of how much cultural variability there is in the concepts that we use when trying to classify and give meaning to different conditions. So when we talk about culture, what do we mean? In anthropology, culture is our central concept and yet one that we could provide hundreds of different definitions for. But generally, we mean the shared meanings and values that people uh, use in order to make their world understandable, logical, meaningful to them. When we use the term society, we mean something different. We mean the actual patterns of interaction. So when we talk about a marriage practice or we talk about uh, a kinship system, we're talking about society because we're talking about how people interact. Um, when we talk about whether people believe that a particular kinship system is good or bad, then we're talking about culture, the values associated with those social interactions. And they can sometimes change independently of one another. In all places and at all times. One only has to think of the United States Supreme Court to understand uh, the difference between society and culture, that 
Supreme Courts are always trying to negotiate between a set of meanings and values that are held constant within a constitution and the changes in a society that then challenge how those meanings and values get applied to any particular context. So when we talk about culture in regard to a disability or a mental illness, from an anthropological perspective, what we want to emphasize is that classifications, diagnoses, disabilities are continually framed and reframed in different historical periods. That what we see at one time isn't necessarily what we see at another time. Take post-traumatic stress disorder, for example. The symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, in, which was, of course, called shell shock in World War I, were lack of balance contorted body shape, um, uh, odd gait, um, inability to walk, uh, paralysis of the limb. And yet, the kinds of things that we associate with PTSD today, like traumatic memory, flashbacks, things like hypervigilance, um, those symptoms only appear now, and they were never even reported by World War I psychiatrists. Another example would be Asperger's disorder, which we believed for some decades was a real disorder, and yet now it's removed from the diagnostic manual of the American Psychiatric Association. So was that a real disorder, or was it not a real disorder? For an anthropologist who takes a perspective that focuses on social construction, we would say there are no disorders that are, in fact, real, the experiences are real, the phenomena are real, the suffering is real, but how we frame it, how we think about it, how we conceptualize, categorize, cluster symptoms together is variable from time to time. In fact, let's just look at how autism, in a sense, became cool. In Silicon Valley today, the nerd is no longer the person who is a social misfit as the disabling properties of autism, like hyperfocus, like narrow interests, like the kind of systematization that is associated with autism, are reconfigured in more positive terms. Why? Because we have a different economy, because we have a very different technology. Another hallmark of anthropological perspectives on disabilities and illnesses is what we like to call holism. And by holism, we mean that we don't view any part of society as being isolable from any other part. For example, if we're looking at uh, a condition such as eating disorders, we can't separate that from the dietary practices of a particular society. We can't separate that from the uh, kinship system in which the person with the eating disorder exists. If we're looking at somebody hearing voices, we can't separate that from religious practices or religious beliefs and how those voices might be contextualized within that religion, both in terms of how the religion explains it, but also in the content of the apparent psychosis itself. And so what we like to say is that you have to take a holistic perspective. And we're going to see that in a moment. Uh, I'm been going to give some counterintuitive examples in order to challenge the kinds of things that you take for granted. Because what anthropologists find is a, a crucial problem in the study of mental illness and illness in general is that uh, we, we come up against a resistance to seeing our concepts as social construction. So I want to give you some counterintuitive examples in order to kind of jolt you into an anthropological way of thinking. And here are three counterintuitive examples. The first one is a claim that before the late 1700s in Europe, there were only males and no females. Now, that sounds like a very bizarre claim, but I'll actually prove to you that it was true. Before 1892, there were no homosexuals or heterosexuals in the world. 
another counterintuitive claim that we'll see is true. Uh, menstruation, it is not natural to menstruate once a month. Now, these are things that we would take to be self-evident, things that we would take to be true and axiomatic in all times and places, uh, but uh, that there would always be people who had sex with people of the same sex, that there have always been in humanity, males and females, that the body is set up so that ovulation occurs and menses occur on a particular cycle. How can these possibly be social construction? Well, regarding the first claim, there was no separate anatomical nomenclature for women's sexual and reproductive anatomy until the late, teens, late 1700s. Why? Because biologists did not believe that there were two distinct sexes. They certainly believed that there were people who were women and people who were men, but these were just different manifestations of a spectrum from male to female. And it was only with the first industrial revolution in Europe that we see a demand, intellectual demand, for making the world stable through science, and that means making all kinds of identities and roles stable as well. The sexes had to be separated and incommensurate in a stable world, comprehensible by science. The categories and the classifications emerge out of the enlightenment, and then individual and social identities become reduced to the organ. Let's take the second claim. Before 1892, there was no homosexuality in the world. Well, lots of men had sex with men and women had sex with women, probably, you know, for as long as there have been humans. But they weren't classified or labeled as a particular kind of person. In fact, in ancient Greece, um, men who had sex with men, that really didn't mean much. What, what had meaning was whether it was a citizen with a non-citizen or a slave with a boy or a, or a woman with a man. But it wasn't that there was a kind of person called a homosexual, nor was there a kind of person called a heterosexual. Homosexuality had to await psychology and the development of the notion that there could be an inner disposition uh, for a sexual orientation. And homosexuality is first used in the scientific literature in 1892 and first appears in the Oxford English Dictionary in 1976. Part of having no concept of homosexuality meant that people were much freer to touch each other and be affectionate with each other because there was no fear of being called a homosexual since there was no such label. Um, here's an example of a baseball team, University of Pennsylvania in the 1800s, where the men are just kind of lounging on top of each other and touching. And here's from my own university, the George Washington University baseball team, where you can see in the age of homosexuality, there is a need to uh, keep one's hands to oneself. The third counterintuitive claim is that it is not natural to menstruate once a month. Well, how did we evolve? We did not evolve as nuns. We did not evolve by not having sexual re reproduction. We evolved much in the way that many Africans live today with a much smaller number of menses. The Dogon of Mali, for example, have on average 100 menses in a lifetime compared to the United States where women have between 350 and 400 in large part because of smaller uh, uh, birth um, cohorts, uh, birth control pills, uh, people having a shorter period of time during which they choose to be reproductive, and also much, much shorter breastfeeding periods of time as greater amounts of lactation, both in terms of time and frequency of bouts, decreases ovulation. Uh, menarche is later in non-Western societies, and women have many more births, meaning that they are going to have many fewer periods. Well, then why is it that we believe that a birth control pill pack should give us a period every month. And that is because the inventor of the birth control pill, John Rock, was a devout Catholic who believed that Pope Pius would more likely approve the contraceptive pill were he to not alter nature. And nature, for him, was a woman in isolation from any kind of sexual reproduction. 
again, this is a holism view here because we're talking about Catholicism influencing the way in which we think about something as natural as menstruation. And so what we come to think of as a condition, what we come to think of as normal or abnormal, these things emerge through history as scholars seek to employ a scientific rationality to carve up the world and divide up the world into meaningful categories. And psychiatric illnesses, when they are first named and diagnosed, when we moved away from just thinking about things like feeble-mindedness and idiocy and lunacy and so on towards things like depression, schizophrenia, anxiety, we start then to see stigma really become important because now we have these categories of people that can be either included or excluded from society. Schizophrenia provides a good example of this. We know that the origin of the concept of schizophrenia is linked to both scientific and non-scientific or um, causes. One of the things that scholars in France and Germany and England in the 17 and 1800s were trying to do was to explain why human beings were different. I mean, if there was one humanity, why, are, why is there so much difference in the world? And some people, like the French writer Buffon, believed that we could explain human variation in the world, why there were people in Africa who were very different from people in Asia who were very different from people in Europe, was because we had degenerated from a pure form, Adam and Eve, that pure form which was represented in their work at least as the European. And that degeneration led not only to cultural variation and racial variation, but it also led to the degeneration of the mind, which is why you, they believed one could have the Industrial Revolution in Europe, but it would not have existed among the Dogon and Mali. There was also a view held by other authors that humans were different because of disintegration, that the mind disintegrated, that the mind was a fragile whole that could split apart into various pieces. And when Kreplin first talks about dementia precox, which of course eventually is, is named by, by Bloiler schizophrenia or split mind, he was drawing not only on the ideology of progress and evolution in science, he was not only drawing on the growth of institutions where people with mental illnesses were separated from society. He was also drawing on the culture of his day, which viewed the human mind as fragmentary and divided and held together by a glue that could deteriorate. And so he did not invent this notion of the fragile mind, Kreplin, nor did the notion of the fragile mind create Kreplin's definition. They were part of that same whole. And so what we see alongside of the development of the notion of schizophrenia is a whole series of art representa artistic representations, poems, novels, doppelganger, Frankenstein, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, a picture of Dorian Gray, Faust, in me there are two souls, alas, and their division tears my life in two that we have a good side and a bad side, a dark side and a light side. Take a look at advertisements for antipsychotic drugs, and you will often find a dark figure paired with a light figure. And even in 2016, there was this advertisement in the psychiatric literature, schizophrenia can tear patients apart. He is held together by glue. And because he has not taken his medication, he is going to have his world shattered into two. You can see the fracture about to go uh, between his legs at his feet. This is an advertisement for Risperdal, one of the typical antipsychotics that is very popular on the market today. Another thing I'd like to point out about this particular representation is it also tells us that when we have a particular conception of a condition, we also create a certain image of a person, of what that person is like, what their capabilities are, what their potential is. 
The person with schizophrenia here does not have a manicured haircut. He's unshaven. He's not wearing a suit. He's not a businessman. He's a janitor. So it tells us something about the way in which there are uh, notions of, 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 of the trajectory of who this person is. When we look at autism, we also see that there is a notion of what has happened to the person. In, uh, I believe it was 2010, um, there was an advertising campaign by New York University Child Study Center in order to promote treatment of a variety of childhood mental illnesses, including autism. And this is one of the advertisements that appeared in magazines and it appeared on uh, kiosks uh, for buses in Manhattan. And it was a ransom note, like the kind of note in old movies where the kidnapper would send the note to the parent of the person that had been kidnapped or to the police. We have your son. We will make sure he will not be able to care for himself or interact socially as long as he lives. This is only the beginning, signed autism. Now, you may at one level just find this to be creepy. You may at another level look at it and say, well, this is a particular view of autism, that the person has been taken away, that the person has been stolen, that there's a true individual that has somehow been kidnapped, and we have to find that person and replace him. And this resonates with a long-standing notion that either autism is a kind of loss of the person or loss of the soul, or that autism is a fortress, and we have to break through that fortress to get to the person hiding behind it. What all of these examples tell us is that culture isn't only about the people who have the condition that we're talking about. Culture is also about the experts. It's about science. Culture is about history. It's about the people who come up with the terms and the categories, who tell us how to think about human variation. This is why I found it so comforting to read the Surgeon General's report in 2001, in which the Surgeon General wrote, culture is a concept not limited to patients. Clinicians and service systems naturally emerge in their own cultures, have been ill-equipped to meet the needs of patients from different backgrounds. This is a key point that helps us to understand that a cultural perspective on autism is also a cultural perspective on the so-called experts. Now, we know that any term that becomes used anywhere will only be used if it has meaning, if it does something for us. So why did we have Asperger's disorder? Not because scientists were stupid or wrong, but because Asperger's disorder was needed at a time when the term autism was so stigmatizing, and yet there were many people who were capable of, of being very successful in school and in jobs and so on, and, and a lot of people wanted a less stigmatizing term for, as you know, what, what came to be considered to be quote-unquote, high-functioning autism. We don't need Asperger's anymore, and we don't use it. The Navajo Indians use the term perpetual childhood. It makes more sense to them than autism because it's really about caring for the child in perpetuity. Uh, in India, clinicians still call autism the Hindi word for madness because the concept of autism hasn't become particularly helpful yet. If you don't have a service out there, under the category of autism, what sense does it make to have that category since services are driven by the category? I was in Namibia, in rural northeastern Namibia, just last May. And I found there as well the term autism was not going to have meaning, either for clinicians or local communities. And that's in large part, too, because autism is so often seen in the psychological health fields as idiopathic, that it is unrelated to anything that can be seen as a causal factor. Now, my daughter has autism. She's 24 now. 
Now, we can say that she has autism and that that autism is not associated with fetal alcohol syndrome because her mother did not drink during pregnancy. We know that she wasn't malnourished. She didn't have a difficult birth. She didn't have HIV or AIDS. She did not have some form of tuberculosis or measles that could have caused her to have some neurological damage. So we can say she has autism, but does it make sense to use that term in a society like the societies that I was with in northeastern Namibia, where we can't disarticulate all of these different kinds of conditions? So does it make sense to say autism? Are we talking about a symptom or a syndrome or a feature? One of the things we do know in the United States is that the way in which we think about autism today did emerge from social and cultural changes that we can identify. We know that autism was not diagnosed as much as it is today when there were no child psychiatrists around to do it. When childhood wasn't conceived as distinct from adulthood and when childhood psychiatry did not constitute a separate specialty. We know that there was less of a desire to have subcategories of children's mental illnesses when people were in institutions because there were not those kinds of specialized services out in the community and the deinstitutionalization required a greater attention to classification. We know that advocacy and the disability, uh, disability rights movement also shifted to make sure that uh, we were able to have a voice outside of just the experts, but that there would be a greater number of voices that could challenge and change the views of what we call the particular mental illness or disability. And we also know that stigma decreased, in large part because of the decline of psychoanalysis as a means of understanding autism. Anybody who's read any, you know, I don't have to tell you, I'm sure that all of you know very well that uh, only a few decades ago, uh, a child with autism was seen to be the product of a disturbed family and that the mother and the father and the family was seen to be the cause of much of the childhood pathology associated with autism. We also know that we've made incredible strides in decreasing barriers to care for minorities, for the poor. Now that is not to say that everything's good, but there has been progress and we see this in prevalence estimates. For example, in the Centers for Disease Control estimates for the uh, changes in autism classification, we see uh, an increase between 2000, in the uh, 2006 to 2008 data of just over 15% among whites, but a 42% increase among blacks. And you would look at this and say, oh, well, um, there's a black individuals, Hispanic individuals are getting more autism. Or we can look at it through the anthropological lens, which says that people are getting services now that they didn't used to get. They are now getting identified for treatment when they didn't used to get that. Uh, in fact, uh, this is the case that um, minorities and the poor uh, still today are less often uh, diagnosed with autism than their wealthier uh, white counterparts and that emotional disorder and conduct disorder and all kinds of other uh, conditions uh, are, are, uh, uh, are much more likely to be used uh, in these populations. What we then know is that psychiatric diagnoses come about because of a set of contextual preconditioned ways of seeing. We see autism everywhere now, and it doesn't mean that it wasn't here before, but we see it now. We view people's behavior through that lens. We never would have imagined in the show American Top, America's Next Top Model that this woman, Heather, who became a finalist in 2007 on this show, uh, would classify herself as autistic. We could never have imagined two decades before this that any expert, any scientist, any educator would have included her within the category of what constituted autism. 
And so we see it now more than before because we are seeing something different than we saw before. We see this as well in South Korea and in other cultures. One of the things that I've talked about in my book on Strange Minds is the significance of a film in South Korea called Marathon. Marathon was a film that almost single-handedly increased autism awareness in South Korea because it showed a person who had autism but had autism not because he had a bad mother, not because he had bad genes. He just had autism. And he was appreciated. And people fought for him. And we saw after this movie significant changes in attitudes in South Korea toward autism. For example, there was a school that was being built for children with disabilities, and the community in which it was being built demanded that the windows only face the interior because that nobody in the community wanted to be able to see a child with a disability. They threw bricks through windows when they were first been built. They cut telephone wires and electrical wires. And today in South Korea, there is a popular television, well, there was, it's all over now, but there was a popular television show called The Good Doctor um, in which uh, there is a surgeon who is autistic, a highly skilled surgeon who's autistic. And that Korean uh, TV show has now been adopted by Hollywood, and ABC this fall will be airing a new series about an American autistic surgeon, also with the name Good Doctor. And if anybody's wondering what the Hangul or the Korean language says up there, it's actually just the Korean transliterated or the English transliterated into Korean script, and it says Good Doctor. That's what that is. So if we now find autism to be a meaningful and less stigmatized category, then we're going to see an increase in prevalence. In fact, that's what we see in a single birth cohort that was studied in Minnesota in 1989. All of these children were born the same year in 1989. And the uh, prevalence estimate for age six was 13 in 10,000, 21 in 10,000 at age nine, 33 in 10,000 at age 11. And we see this continuing to increase at age 13 and at age 15. And it is a disorder or condition that we know emerges before the age of 36 months. So are these brand new cases? No, there's a recalibration of what it means to be autistic. And there are more services under that category, and so therefore people then go into those categories. Because we know that autism does not suddenly emerge brand new at the age of 15 or 13 or 11. But that's because that category is useful. If you do not have a category that is useful in your society, you won't use that category. Autism won't be used. Just recalibrating things can have a big impact. We know from the studies of hypertension that just um, increasing the range of what counts as high blood pressure will increase the number of people who have high blood pressure. We know that if we include in schizophrenia, the prodrome, the softer signs, the early signs of schizophrenia, as the DSM describes it, then we will also see an increase in the number of people who are treated under that category, and they don't require the full-blown syndrome in order to be eligible for treatment under that category. We see things anew and then cannot imagine that we didn't see them before. For example, we see this every day. It's a very common logo throughout the world. But what people don't use or don't see is the arrow, in it, which I've shaded in yellow, the negative space. We just read it as FedEx and we don't see that arrow. Now, if we go back to the original logo, you now, your eye goes straight to that arrow like a laser, and you'll never look at this the same way again. And you will see that arrow every time you look at it. And so we become primed to see things that we had never seen before. In the same way that now people are going to institutions like prisons 
like residential facilities, and they're seeing people who have previously had a diagnosis of just intellectual disability, who have not been diagnosed with autism, but who would in fact fit the category of autism. And similarly, we see that there is a decrease in the United States of people with an intellectual disability diagnosis. At the same time, we see an increase in autism. It's important to look at this particular chart um, or particular graph and think of it in light of Poliak et al.'s uh, study in, I believe it was 2016 or 2015, in which his group showed that the proportion of American school children with a special education classification in the United States had remained static over the past 10 to 15 years but that autism had increased by approximately 300% in terms of classifications. Now, how do you have 300% increase in autism, but a static proportion of children receiving special education? You've got to have other things dropped, and one of those things is, is intellectual disability. And if you go to other parts of the world, wherever that might be, you might go to South Africa, you might go to India, when you go to the urban center, you might find that things are not that different from the way in which they are in any other major urban center. But imagine you go to a rural location where autism won't do any good for you. What are the terms people are going to use? How are they going to think about the person? Words like brain disorder, mental, crazy, things of this sort get used, not because the people in these locations are bad. Or, um, or lack knowledge. It's not because the clinicians don't know the word. It has to do with what the meaning is publicly for that category. One of the things we did in South Korea, where I had worked in uh, rural South Korea, where the term autism is not used at all, and then I worked in urban South Korea, where the word autism is used often. And um, one of the things we did was we, we, we noticed that only 2% of children in the Korean uh, schools received any special education care. Now compare that to the United States or the UK where it's 12 or 13%. A huge difference. 12 to 13 to 14% of American and British children receive some kind of special education service, whether that's extra time on an exam or intensive service. Only 2% in South Korea. Is it possible that South Korean children don't need special education services, but that so many, uh, such a much larger percentage of the population of England and the United States does? Probably not. And so we did a large six-year study of seven to 12-year-old children uh, in a urban area uh, just outside of Seoul, South Korea. And we found uh, in our study, in the author's are all here. I was the principal investigator on that. Um, the main epidemiologist associated was Young Shin Kim. And we see um, what we find a, is a 2.64% prevalence rate. Now that's much, much higher than any kind of prevalence estimate that we see as an average for the United States. But it's certainly not outside of the ballpark for what we see with the CDC estimates for New Jersey. But this was a remarkable finding for South Koreans who didn't really know what to do with it. If 2.64% of people uh, in the schools had uh, the, would, class, would, would qualify for an autism spectrum disorder diagnosis, what does that mean about the school population? And it means that two-thirds of the cases in our sample were in the mainstream school population, undiagnosed and untreated. And one reason for this is that autism did not have meaning for driving services in South Korea, nor was it an acceptable category yet because the stigma was so great. What was that stigma? That stigma was that you were a bad family, that you had bad genes, that the, the stigma of, of people not wanting to marry into your family because of the likelihood that they may have 
autism, if they got married, and so on. And so one of the things I did after this study was to look at the way in which uh, people dealt with this new um, concept of autism. And with a colleague of mine in South Korea, we did a lot of um, interviewing and focus groups on these people who now had had their children diagnosed with autism, and they rejected the category, rejecting it for a kind of homegrown category, which they termed border children, meaning my child doesn't have autism, but my child has a tendency toward autism. My child is on the border. And we also started to do community outreach in the United States, in South Korea, and in South Africa to see if we could find ways to understand what some of the barriers might be to a diagnosis. One way to do this was to adapt and translate certain kinds of documents so that they were acceptable and appropriate in cultural context. And we used mixed methods, meaning both quantitative assessments and uh, qualitative assessments. A quantitative part of interviewing is where you use cultural consensus modeling, and you look for the kind, the frequency and the saliency of ideas, symbols, words, concepts that are associated with a particular condition so that you can determine how to best communicate with that population. Qualitatively, you look then at how people think about those uh, concepts that you've now systematically studied as important or salient or not. In New York, there has been a dramatic increase in the number of Korean applicants for care for their children. Uh, there has been an increase in the range of interventions and uh, severity. There still is fear. And there still are barriers to care. One of those barriers to care is, is again, what we like to call stigma, although stigma needs to be qualified in cultural context. Korean Americans we found in New York were afraid of strong medicine. They were afraid that a diagnosis of autism might be a diagnosis forever and that it would go on for the rest of time. There was a fear among some Koreans that one couldn't treat a condition if one helped the symptoms, that if you couldn't see the anxiety and the irritability and the difficulty in a child, then you couldn't treat it. And that a child had to be strong and withstand those without medication. So these are some of the key cultural findings from our New York study. We found that people there viewed autism as isolated, out of, people with autism as out of touch, people having an emotional block. A person could make himself stop developing or block himself. We found that barriers to care also included an understanding of genetics and heredity that was not uh, parallel to the scientific view of genetics and heredity. People viewed autism as genetic, but saw it as inherited, as opposed to de novo mutations, where you could have a mutation for the very first time in a family. There was also a religious component to beliefs in autism in which people wondered if my child is this way because he is made that way by God, well then what right do I have to interfere with God's will? I want to switch now to talking a little bit about the decrease in stigma because I think that that is a central element in studying the relationship between culture and any condition. And I've, I've always liked this quotation from Jim Sinclair. It's an old one, but he says, we need and deserve families who can see us and value us for ourselves, not families whose vision of us is obscured by the ghosts of children who never lived. Grieve if you must for your own lost dream, but don't mourn for us. And I think that we're seeing a resurgence now of, uh, of advocacy in mental illness in which people are starting to say, 
if you are concerned about mental illness, think about me, the person who has the condition, or me, the person who has the disability, and not what you think it says about you. Now, think about all of these communities that are very afraid of what autism might mean about their family, what it might mean about their community. And Jim Sinclair is saying, you need to be concerned about the care of the person and the barriers to care need to be overcome. And I am encouraged by the way in which an economically transformative society like the United States or India or, uh, or other high-tech centers are helping us to take the notion of the nerd that was seen as so stigmatizing in the past and now see it as something positive. And I feel this way as well in association with my daughter. And here you see a picture of her uh, looking at the, pic at the uh, camera, uh, who is finding opportunities for employment now that she never would have found before. She's finding opportunities to work with animals, which is her dream. She's finding opportunities to work in a laboratory setting where she's actually helping uh, scientific research. And she's living a productive in meaningful life. Well, so one of the things I, I just want to emphasize again as I end now is that when we talk about something being a cultural construction, something that exists within culture, we're not saying that that person isn't real. We're not saying that that person's capabilities or distress aren't real. What we're saying is that the ideas that we develop in order to understand that person are coming out of a particular time and a particular place. And that's a really encouraging point because if it's not fixed in nature, then we can change it, then we can do better. And we don't have to look now and say, well, this is the way it is. We can always change, we can always do better. And I think that's what you know, most of you out there in the, um, in the listening audience uh, aim to do uh, with your your life and your careers. Thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Grinker, for a wonderful presentation. That was very interesting. Um, we've had a lot of great questions from the audience already, and I just wanted to remind everyone, I see a few of you with your hands raised. Instead of raising your hands, please type your question into the chat box. Um, and we can go ahead and incorporate those questions into our question and answer portion of the study or of the session. So Dr. Grinker, the first question that we have from the audience is um, by giving diagnoses and labeling children and individuals, um, this person wants to know if we're just adding more stigma and separation and whether or not we should be moving away from classifications of disorders. That's a really good question. Um, I would refer the questioner to a good book by the philosopher Ian Hacking, H-A-C-K-I-N-G, called The Social Construction of What? And in that book and in other places, he talks about how when we label, when we classify people, we may in fact be creating a new kind of individual or a new kind of person. And depending on the context in which we're, we're doing that, it might actually be detrimental to them. There was a famous case in sociology called The Making of Blind Man by Robert, Blind Man by Robert Scott. And one of the things that he showed in studying young students who were admitted to a residential school for the blind was that once they were labeled blind, they stopped using the residual vision that they had because very few were 100% blind. And so by being labeled blind, they stopped looking and they stopped seeing. So classifications can change the way we see. They always will change the way we see ourselves. Now, if it's not stigmatizing, if it's not going to prevent you from doing the things that you want to do in your life and achieving your goals, I see no problem with it. But we always have to be sensitive to the fact that that kind of process is in place. Wonderful. Um, the next question is, 
Um, do you think the increase in autism diagnosis has emerged in any way in relation to the changes of our work and employment constructs? So, for example, jobs have changed and what we value in an employee has changed. So how has a diagnosis of autism interacted with these changing roles? Uh, a gr another great question. Um, I, I know it's not a yes or no question, but I feel like saying yes. Uh, because uh, I, I do believe that the um, lack, that the, 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 the decrease in stigma associated with the concept of autism has been occasioned by the ability for people with the skills associated with autism to be successful and to contribute economically. I, um, when I was in a Namibia, um, and I was studying a group of people called the Junkwasi. Now, I don't know if this uh, slide will come up that I'm showing you here, uh, but this is the Junkwasi, sometimes called the Bushman. And there was a man with a child who didn't speak, and he made odd movements with his fingers, the child. Uh, he was sometimes teased, but he was overall included in everyday life. I mean, he looked to me without doing any kind of, you know, without having any expert do a formal assessment, he just looked to me as a, you know, an observer to be kind of classically autistic. And I said to his father, well, have you ever taken him to a doctor to find out why he doesn't talk and why he makes these odd movements with his finger? And his father said, well, why should I? He takes great care of the goats and he has a good memory, we always leave things, we hunt and gather, and we, we always leave a knife or something out there, and he knows where everything is. And when he comes back and he herds the goats, he knows the goat schedule, he knows which goats like to graze in which areas, and there's no problem. And I think what that tells you is that when somebody does provide or is, is allowed to provide a contribution to everyday life, then we will see less stigma, and we will see um, a greater openness and inclusion and affection for that person and what, both their, what, what their skills are. Everybody has deficits. The question is, what, what skills do you have? And really, as a follow-up to that question, um, how are doctors or psychologists or other clinicians perceiving or interpreting autism symptoms in cultures that do stigmatize autism? Um, I, I think that they are doing the kinds of things that we see in, in South Korea, um, which is to give a different sort of term, uh, like this homegrown term, border child. Um, border children is interesting because it's, it's, a, um, it's not a pervasive concept, meaning, you know, we used to use PDD um, all the time in the United States as a way of describing uh, autism in a sort of milder way, PDD, NOS, pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified. And but the, the key point about the pervasiveness is that autism was seen to um, involve multiple domains: communication, behavior, speech, social communication, speech, and so on. The concept of border children in South Korea is not pervasive. It's only described and conceived of as a social deficit, whereas the intellectual deficit is, con is, is, is or any cognitive aspect is seen to be um, unrelated. And so what you see is people trying to grasp with, you know, or deal with, negotiate with how to understand the fact that they have to explain to themselves and to others what this person is like, and, and that person also has to explain to others about him or herself, in a way that is not going to hurt him or her. Um, I mean, that's, that's one way. See... Which... Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say that that's one reason why Bill Gates is mentioned by South Koreans as somebody that is like a border child, um, because people say he's He's, uh, he's the, the sort of the ultimate nerd, Bill Gates. Um, but uh, 
he doesn't have autism. He's, he, he's, he's the richest man in the world, or one of the richest men in the world. And my child can be just like Bill Gates. Gotcha. Um, and kind of shifting to a different perspective, aside from the clinician, um, do you see a different way of how parents from diverse cultures resist um, or even push the direction of autism research? Um, I, I think that the question about whether people from different kinds of populations are, are influencing autism research is, is one that I, I can't answer. I don't have any good evidence that the research that people are doing uh, in the laboratories, in the clinics, are being influenced directly by any particular population advocacy. But I do believe that there are pushes for services that are being pushed by particular populations. Um, populations, uh, for example, rural communities in the United States that are pushing for greater services in their area. Uh, communities in more sparsely populated regions where you don't have access to child psychiatry or child expertise. Uh, where they're fighting to try to get those specializations represented in their communities. Um, if you just think about uh, a place like Montana or Wyoming, uh, each of those states has maybe only one or two uh, board-certified child psychiatrists. And yet many of the requirements for getting services require that you have some kind of, of, of you know, child psychiatrist attesting to a particular diagnosis. So I see more populations mm -hmm. trying to get availability to services, and that would be true in rural Namibia as well, um, than pushing people to actually do research, scientific research. Wonderful. Um, we have a couple of questions about um, the idea of savants. Um, the first mm -hmm. one is about how um, the Hollywood idea of savants has affected social stigma or the understanding of autism. So essentially the concept that autistic people may or even must have highly specialized skills like musical talents um, could give a misconception about what autism is and how people are affected. So how, in your opinion, has that idea affected social stigma? Yeah, that's a great question because the savant is, is much more interesting. Um, uh, to a uh, movie audience than an ordinary person. Um, uh -huh. And so, so all personalities, whether they're, they're soldiers or artists or lovers or people with autism, whatever it is in a, um, in, in a film, it, it's, it, in an artistic representation, it, it will be exaggerated. And the difficulty is that if the moviegoer is looking at that individual as somehow representing what autism is like, then they may think that all people are that way. And I think that there is one issue that uh, Allison Singer from the Autism Science Foundation has raised on occasion, which is that the emphasis in the media on the high functioning, for lack of a better term, I don't like that term, but the, the, you know, the person who's sort of a super achiever, the savant, the emphasis on that, what, like the ABC series that's going to come out called The Good Doctor or Sherlock Holmes or whatever it might be, takes a lot of the attention away from the more involved, the, 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 more, the, the people who need more intensive involvement, the, the really highly um, uh, involved kids who have profound intellectual disability and really need intensive care. Um, the, the emphasis that autism somehow uh, exists as the savant uh, is really taking a highly, a very rare and unusual condition and, have, and reducing uh, autism to that. And then the person who has the, the, the child with a profound intellectual disability says, well, where, where is the attention to my child? Autism as it's construed today isn't my child. I think fundamentally there, what we're talking about is a category, autism, that has become so big, so broad, 
extending from the person who's going to need lifelong care to the person who might make a million or billion dollars in Silicon Valley, that there is some reason to start questioning whether the term is being used too promiscuously, whether the term is losing its meaning because it's used so broadly. And does this idea of the savant exist cross-culturally? I don't think so. I mean, I certainly haven't seen it uh, 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 in, in any community that I've worked with. Uh, the notion of an expert exists, but not the notion of an expert with concept of autism. So, for example, in, among the Junkwasi or among the FA pygmies, with whom I, I lived for two years in Congo, um, many of the people who are the experts on the spiritual world or the experts on healing and illness and herbal remedies are people who you might look at and, and, and think are unusual or odd. They're eccentric. They may live alone and not marry. They may have seizures. And you look at them and you say, these are unusual people. And unusual people have different pockets of expertise. But, to, but, but the notion, the word savant is something that I think is um, you know, highly uh, culturally localized for us. Um, they, what they would say, you know, among the FA in the Congo is, well, this is the man who knows this, and this is the man who knows that. And they respect those pockets of expertise in the same way that the uh, Juntwati man respects and his family respects his son's uh, tremendous uh, knowledge about the schedule and the movements and the rhythm of the goat. Um, so the next question is of looking at how um, we, where should we begin um, in uh, cultures such as Zimbabwe um, to understand autism without interfering in a culture uh, of a country where there's really no known services for autism? I, um, I think that there's this fundamental problem that a lot of uh, academics and journalists have noted recently, which is, you know, are we imposing are we, are we imposing categories on the world that are just going to hurt people? What happens when I go to, you know, South Korea and we diagnose people with autism in a place where autism is stigmatizing? Are we doing harm? And it's really a catch-22 because you don't know whether or not you're doing harm or you're doing help or, or you're helping. I think the most important thing that I've found, and we certainly found this, um, Amy Weatherby from Florida State, and I found this working in uh, KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa, is that we didn't need to use the word autism. We didn't need to have, always have the category. Because the category didn't drive any particular service, what we needed to do was talk about the particular needs of the person. So we talked about the person's um, need for social skills training, or we talked about the person's need to be able to have joint attention in school, or we talked about the person's need to improve their, their sleep or their irritability. But talking about autism was kind of like this black hole that would suck out all of the important conversation. I think autism, like any term, can become that way. I think stigma is that way, too. We talk about stigma. But if we, imagine we didn't have the word stigma. If we didn't have the word stigma, then we would talk about the specific things we would need to do to help people. If we didn't have the word autism, we'd have to talk about the particular phenomena of that individual. And we wouldn't have to reduce it to this term that can be so loaded. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not such a big advocate of classifications at all unless they're going to help. If they're not going to help, why use it? What would be the purpose of using it? So what's the purpose of using autism to help somebody with their social skills? Just help them with their social skills. So on that point, um, you had mentioned earlier that Asperger's is really no longer a useful category, but there um, are quite a bit of people, um, and especially individuals, with um, who identify as having Asperger's and feel strongly like it is. Um, so how do you kind of reconcile that self-identity with a classification 
with, um, you know, kind of the stigmas that also come along with a classification. And, well, there, there's a, always a difference between the way in which people think about themselves and talk about themselves and something that we consider to be a form of pathology that is reliable, valid, scientifically based. There doesn't seem to be any scientific basis for a distinct category of Asperger's. The difference between Asperger's and autistic disorder has never been uh, uh, clearly identified. Even the very best uh, neuropsych testers, like even those who authored the ADOS and the ADIR, cannot say that they can reliably distinguish between various subtypes of autism. But that is different from talking about what has meaning to a human being. Homosexuality is no longer a pathological term. Until 1972, it was considered to be a mental illness by the American Psychiatric Association. It doesn't mean that you don't find the word homosexual or the word gay or the word straight to be a useful term to talk about ourselves. I think we can distinguish between what we consider to be um, a form of scientific knowledge and what we consider to be an, a form of personal knowledge. And um, how do you um, see having diagnosis or classifications um, as far as the necessity of them to motivate public policy and um, kind of drive funding for other programs and services? Um, I, th I think that uh, we, the prevalence increase um, is a direct result of there being a kind of economic imperative. Um, and if you have more, in some places, if you have more autism, you will get more money to the schools. And, and, and where financial considerations are, um, are, are not an issue, you might see less of a inclination to diagnose. I think that there's a very uh, clear connection between any particular diagnosis and the economic uh, realities. Let me give you an example of this. Um, in some states in the United States, um, schools are just given a particular amount of money to provide special ed services. In other school systems, there's a different amount of money, not a bulk single sum, but different amounts for different kinds of conditions. If you have more autism cases, you will get more money. A, an educator, an uh, education uh, scholar named Kwok, wrote a few years ago about California's special education in public schools, and she found that when the state of California switched from a single bulk sum payment, uh, I'm sorry, from, from, from payments for particular conditions to a single bulk payment that autism diagnoses went down. So there's definitely an economic component here. We have now PhD programs in autism, MA programs in autism studies, all kinds of alternative therapies, speech therapy, the number of speech therapists is, is when there are tens, and t tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of speech therapists in the world. And more than 50% of their caseload is autism or if not autism children. Um, I think that art therapy, play therapy, all kinds of other, uh, other, other forms of, uh, of, of income are associated with the uh, increase in the category of autism. And, and so as an anthropologist, we want to look, you know, an anthropologist wants to say, okay, here's a condition, here's something we call autism, how is it related to economics? How is it related to social change? How is it related to politics? We want to see autism as not this, this thing that exists in isolation from the rest of the world, but is intimately tied with it. And so what would you consider to be your most remarkable experience cross-culturally? Um, something you would support bringing to the U.S. as an approach or method you found that was 
unique and necessary to the advancement of autism awareness here? Um, I think the most remarkable thing that I found cross-culturally was the lack of, an, in, in contrast to my own world, a lack of an obsession with having adults live independently. You know, so many people will ask me about my own child. Will she be able to live independently? And many of the people that I meet in the United States say, I'm so worried about what will happen to my child with autism when I die. What will happen when I die? What will happen to my child? And the thing that you find when you travel around the world is people don't live like that. You have multiple caretakers. You have large families. You have people with social networks that see it as an obligation, a responsibility, something that they want to do to care for their family members. And so I remember the man that I mentioned who's, who had, whose son was so good at hurting the goats, I, I asked him if he was afraid of how his son would be taken care of when he and his wife died. And he looked at me with some confusion and he said, but we can't all die. There will always be someone here. And that was so remarkable to me because I come back and then I look at my child who's living with me and I say, she doesn't have to live independently. In fact, maybe she gets more help and more support and is happier and more productive living with family than she would be if I fell into this, you know, American individualist dream that everybody has to move out of the house at 18 or 21 and live by themselves. And so that's the thing that I really see from other communities and why I put a lot of effort into making sure that my social networks are good, that my family networks are good, so that my child will be cared for because she will have a, always a community in which to live. It's wonderful. Um, so looking at the future of autism research in the areas of culture and disability, um, what are some important areas of research or future directions that you see right now? I think one area of research that, I, that is really uh, important and, and I don't think would be that difficult to do is to characterize what autism looks like in a variety of different places. What is its manifestation? What does it look like? And, and, and what are the outcomes? We have had um, in the literature some really um, intensive studies of what schizophrenia, for example, looks like in a range of settings over a long period of time. We, we don't really have that as much with autism. We don't know we don't, can't characterize autism in, in, in Zimbabwe or in one part of Zimbabwe or in South Africa or in Uganda or in Fiji or wherever it might be. Descriptive accounts, I think, will be important. In terms of much more kind of long-term and complex substantive research, I think that it would be interesting to do something like the World Health Organization longitudinal studies where they look at a particular condition and its outcome and uh, prognosis in a variety of settings. We know, for example, that people with schizophrenia tend to have better outcomes in rural, non-industrialized settings. And we need to find out if that's the same thing with autism. Okay. Um, kind of an interesting and different question um, is looking at how, um, knowing that organisms in the environment are interacting strongly with one another, um, how do you see autism as an evolutionarily stable strategy? And is that something that is possible in um, a advanced world that's um, advancing so technologically? That's an interesting question for an anthropologist. I yeah. should emphasize I'm not a physical <laughs> anthropologist. Um, but when we look at um, uh, genetic lines, like the Jim Plotsy, who have one of the oldest, uh, I mean, they have among the oldest DNA, meaning it's the most diverse, it's been around the longest, uh, of, of humans. And if we find autism, it may inform studies on whether or not some of the genes associated with autism have been evolutionarily preserved. That doesn't mean to, that they have been selected for, 
that they're positive or helpful, not everything that's been evolutionarily preserved is advantageous um, unless it, you know, unless it was disadvantageous as well. I mean, we, 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 not everything is, uh, is a immediate product of, of human evolution, particularly if we're talking about something which is extraordinarily complex genetically. It's not like a single gene that uh, is being selected for. But I have to, you know, defer to biological folks on this and, uh, and, and say that there is um, some reason to look into the question of, of, um, of whether autism's um, genetic component is recent or whether it is longstanding. Wonderful. And um, we've got time for about one more question before we switch to talking about career development. Um, and so um, I think to close a really great um, thing for you to talk about is whether or not you have seen um, differences um, in autism within girls or women cross-culturally um, throughout your studies or personal knowledge of other cultures. I wish I could answer that question. Um, I don't. I haven't gathered any data on it, so anything I would say would just be, you know, anecdotal. Um, I, um, I did find uh, in Southern Africa uh, a fair number of girls with, with autism, um, more than I expected, given what we think of as the ratio, but that was purely anecdotal. So, no, I can't answer the question, but, it, again, that's a, another really, really fascinating question. I think what all of these questions together are telling us is that we know so little about autism internationally that the research that people will do now, almost all of it is going to be pioneering, particularly if it's done mm -hmm. in rural settings or in, you know, in settings where there is not a robust health infrastructure. Um, all of that is going to be pioneering work. And so I'm just, I mean, I'm so excited about all these young people who, I don't want to say that I'm so old, but, but you know, young up and coming people starting their careers and doing um, or research internationally. We really need to know um, what it is that uh, we can do internationally to help uh, to ch children to achieve in the same way that we've made progress in Northern Europe and North America to help people achieve in ways they never would have before. I mean, I'm certain that had my daughter been born in 1930, she would not be the kind of person that she is today. She would probably have been in an institution. She would not have graduated from high school. She would not have graduated from a community college. She would not have a paying job. She would probably have a greater number of comorbid issues associated with autism. Um, I'm not saying that, that we're doing everything right, but I am saying that we, we, we have done some things right, and some of those things we can help to uh, to, to transmit and to convey to other places in the world. Wonderful. Well, thank, um, thank you to all the audience for your wonderful questions. Um, as we're wrapping things up, I want to spend a few minutes talking with Dr. Ginger about um, your career development and any advice you have for early career researchers. Um, so to begin with, can you just start by kind of giving us a little background about your training trajectory. So what kind of grad school did you go to? Did you do a postdoc? And any type of early funding that you received that helped to kind of launch your career? Um, so I was trained in, in social anthropology at Harvard University. And it was a pretty mainstream cultural anthropology or social anthropology program in the sense <clears> that we were uh, supposed to study social structure. We were supposed to study how it was that multiplicities of individuals formed into particular kinds of organizations and groups. There were two areas of anthropology that were kind of, I don't mean to use the word stigma again, but they were kind of stigmatized. One was work that involved helping solve a problem in the world. And the second was work that was psychological or dealt with emotions or psychiatric conditions. And 
there were some of us who um, wanted to work on these issues, but we knew we had to wait, that we had to get our degrees and we had to get our jobs. And then once we could get our degrees and our jobs, then we could go out and actually try to, try to do something in the world. Um, two of my classmates, they were one year behind me, uh, were Jim Kim, who's president of the World Bank, and Paul Farmer, who started the NGO Partners in Health. Um, both of them, uh, once they finished their PhDs, really became practicing anthropologists, trying to you know, do things in the world and, and help with, with illnesses. And, um, and I had to wait for that too. And um, so what we're sort of seeing within the field of anthropology now is, is a shift toward a much more engaged anthropology where we don't just uh, work on uh, ivory tower issues, but we also work on applying our expertise in culture, our ability to do interviews, our, our, our interest in going off to travel and live in faraway places, we're bringing that to addressing contemporary problems. And, um, and so that's, that's really been the biggest shift, both within my own career, but also within the field of anthropology itself. And so anybody going into anthropology today need not think that they have to just be experts on Marx and Weber and Durkheim and, you know, the, and uh, uh, Enlightenment philosophy, that they can actually uh, do work uh, that, is in, that has a, a public health or a policy impact. And relating to um, conducting research on, uh, with a cross-cultural perspective, are there particular funding mechanisms you would recommend to advance young researchers? It used to be that the National Institute of Mental Health had a whole lot of mechanisms to help support people doing cross-cultural work. A lot of that disappeared under the directorship of Tom Insull, who pushed the Institute into a much more neuroscience focus. And so it's become more likely for people to get funding sources, to find funding sources that are private, like foundations, the Autism Speaks Foundation, the Autism Science Foundation, and so on, or to add an autism component to larger studies about child health. I think that one of the things that uh, is, is really um, important for people who are trying to work on autism is to, to realize that they can provide um, a component to a larger study, that they can be part of a larger study. Anthropologists tended to work alone. We now are, are joining teams and being part of a larger a larger group that might be located at a public health school or the Centers for Disease Control or uh, an organization like that. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Um, you know, I'm, I can't give people career advice from outside my own career, so it's a little hard to, uh, to, to, to do that. But the funding sources that, that we look at now uh, in the cross-cultural study of illness continue to be um, NIH where possible, though that's decreased, National Science Foundation, and then smaller organizations that are anthropologically focused, like the Venner Grand Foundation. Um, the Venner Grand Foundation is sponsoring a very large um, fancy conference next year, I believe, on, uh, on disability, and particularly childhood uh, disability across cultures. And you mentioned a little bit about um, collaborations outside of your discipline. Um, for young researchers starting, do you have any advice on how to kind of begin those collaborations, especially across disciplines? You know, a lot of people uh, um, uh, think that, let me just, let me go back, let me rephrase that. I think there's a real shortage of people who have qualitative research skills. I think mean, there are plenty of people who have quantitative skills. I don't know that there are that many people who have qualitative skills. So I actually recommend that people learn interviewing skills, uh, that they learn how to do focus groups, they learn how to do group interviews, and to know the difference between a group interview and a focus group. Um, I find that I feel like I'm in demand not because 
I bring anything special to some projects, but because some of the scientists don't know how to even do the basic qualitative work that will help you to generate hypotheses for research. And um, are there um, pros and cons, and what are some of the pros and cons of conducting research in an academic setting like GW? I'm not sure. Can you can you um, elaborate a little bit? What do you mean? You mean where your your subject? Your research subjects are in the college, or do you mean being yeah. a professor? Um, being in a, a, a professor academic setting versus maybe more of a private setting. Um, well, I think that being an academic sometimes when you're working internationally in particular uh, engenders a bit of suspicion about whether you are just trying to gain knowledge and not going to actually do something to help people? Are you going to go to our population, take our DNA, and leave and not help us? Um, it is very, very mm -hmm. difficult sometimes for academics to do research uh, in, in, in a way that doesn't uh, appear to have a direct and positive impact on people. I remember in one project where um, we were looking at low fertility in um, the rainforest of, of Central Africa, where there's this whole low fertility belt, in, in one community, 30, almost 40% of postmenopausal women were um, uh, had never had a live birth, and um, we kept saying we are going to be looking at why it is that you're not having babies. But all they could hear was, "You're going to help us have babies," and we didn't know that we could go to that uh, uh, extent. We didn't. We wanted to find out what was the cause of of the the low fertility in the first place, and um, and so academics have a very difficult job if they're not clearly providing some kind of service or some kind of care. And, and I find that always uh, a challenge working internationally, even in developing international collaborators. Um, it's it, it's hard. Um, the most important thing, of course, working internationally is, it, you know, wherever you are, if you're from India and you're going to Uganda, if you're from Uganda going to India, wherever you're going, you need to have local collaborators so that people can trust that you actually care about that location and you're not just using them for your own career or some kind of esoteric academic knowledge. That's a great piece of advice. And with that, um, what other types of service responsibilities, um, examples like teaching, being on national committees, or, or a part of national organizations, have you found really helpful um, to be involved in for the advancement of your career in general? Well, I love being a professor, and I love being a professor who studies autism, because when I teach my big intro class, and I have 300 students sitting there, and I, that's usually only the first day that all 300 come, but when that's there that first day for the 300 students, and I say, if you have a relative with autism or you know somebody well who has autism, raise your hand, and I see all those hands go up. Uh, it's so exciting for me to have the opportunity to be able to communicate with them and to be able to talk to them about this thing that they that is part of their lives. And so, um, so I love that. And that's a new thing because 20 years ago, if I said, you know, raise your hand if you have a relative or know somebody with autism, you might have one or two people. But now you've got, you know, half the class raising their hand. Um, I think that one of the, the good things about being an academic as well, being a professor, is that it gives you the opportunity, the flexibility to be able to, to engage with a wide group of people. So undergraduates, graduate students, other professors in other parts of the university who may have projects in places that you have never been to. And so it, it, it provides a kind of a launching pad uh, for doing a whole lot of things. And I have to say also being a professor does 
have its own symbolic capital. In other words, it's, if you're being a professor gives you entree to certain type, types of funding mechanisms, certain types of um, statuses that you might not otherwise have. And so, um, you know, as a kind of capstone question, if there was there a foremost piece of advice you received early in your career that helped kind of shape your career trajectory, or do you have um, a piece of foremost advice that you would offer to the early career researchers listening today? Hmm. Let me think about that. Well, I guess the um, best piece of advice I ever got was from my grandfather, who was somewhat of a controversial figure in psychiatry at some point because he was pushing psychiatry to be more biological. And as a child, I grew up across the street from him, and I asked him if um, how you know he dealt with the fact that there were people who thought that he was doing a bad job. And I remember him telling me that if everybody likes what you are saying and doing, you're not doing a good job. And uh, that's given me a bit of confidence um, to sometimes go out on a limb and, um, and express things in perhaps a bolder way than I might have otherwise because I know that if I don't say it, then um, if I don't write it, uh, I, I might not actually have the influence that I want. I want. You want people to read you. You want people to listen to you. And that means you want people to listen to you that you're going to provoke as well. Um, I think it's a really um, important piece of advice. And I know that when I've when I wrote my book and I said the increased prevalence of autism today is an achievement. It means that we're seeing and identifying and giving care to people that we that used to be invisible and that didn't get the help, um, that um, it angered a lot of people uh, and that there were a lot of people who said I was an epidemic denier and that I was denying the reality of vaccines being related to autism, which, of course, we know is, is not a reality um, now. Um, but that kind, of out, that, that kind of reaction meant to me that I was doing something successful because I was getting people to talk. And so, um, so for me, working on autism has been much more rewarding than any other aspect of my career because... I've gone out on a limb and because I've made uh, an argument that uh, about the increased prevalence of autism that other people weren't making. Wonderful. I think that's great advice for everyone. Um, to conclude, we have had quite a few questions, Dr. Grinker, um, that are a little bit more specific to some projects that um, people in the audience have going on about some cross-cultural um, studies of autism. And um, they were wondering if it would be possible to uh, reach out to you about uh, for further advice around their projects personally um, instead of in a broad area like the arena like this. Um, and, yes, um, absolutely. Okay. Um, so anyway, yes, feel definitely. free to contact Dr. Zeringer. <laughs> um, and my so email address is session. easy to find. And we um, we can um, put that with the recordings as well. I believe it's on the, okay. on one of the pages. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to end today's session by thanking Dr. Grinker and our working group, as well as everyone um, in the audience today for joining us. And I wanted to remind you that video replays will be available on the NSTAR website following the six session series. If you simply created a profile on the NSTAR website to register, there are many benefits if you choose to join NSAR as a dues paying member. You can become an NSAR member by visiting the membership page of the website, and we encourage you to do so. If you have any questions or want to get more involved, you can also contact the Student and Trainee Committee at studentcommittee at autism-nsar.org. We hope that you've enjoyed this session of the 2017 NSAR Summer Institute Series. Please take a few moments to fill out the comments section after you end your session, as we are very eager for your feedback. And as a reminder, next week we'll be continuing the series with Sue Fletcher Watson, and she's going to be discussing autism and bilingualism, what do we know and what do we need to know.
Thank you all for listening and participating, and we hope to see you again next week.